the spirit of that constant God that stays through thick and thin and never goes away, we come to worship together to stand with one another and be with one another and stay and worship and sing and listen for a word of God's good hope and peace for the world. Let's join together in our opening as we light our candles. Come on, rise up. 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 Thank you, Ellie. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see everyone on this wonderful, yet another wonderful Sunday morning with the sun shining and the air warming and hopefully a day of restoration ahead of us, um, including, of course, our time together as a worship community. So in that spirit, let's sing together our opening song, Anthem. As you can see, the lyrics are on your screen. We are called, we are chosen, we are Christ for one another. We are promised to tomorrow while we are for him today. We are sign, we are wonder, we are sower, we are seed. We are harvest, we are hunger, we are question, we are creed. Then where can we stand justified in what can we believe? And no one else but he suffered nothing more than he who rose who was justice for the poor who was rage against the night who was hope for peaceful people who was light we are called we are chosen we are christ for one another we are promised to tomorrow while we are for him today we are sign, we are wonder, we are sower, we are seed, we are harvest, we are hunger, we are question, we are creed. Then how are we to stand at all this world of bended knee? And nothing more than barren shadows, no one else but he could save us who was justice for the poor, who was rage against the night, who was hope for peaceful people was light. We are called, we are chosen, we are Christ for one another. We are promised to tomorrow while we are for him today. We are sign, we are wonder, we are sower, we are seed, we are harvest, we are hunger, we are question, we are Amen. Thank you so much, Alex. We come to this place as harvest and hunger, as question and creed. We come to rage against the night. We come to be hope for peaceful people, thankful for the gift that we are called and chosen. The peace of God be with you all and also with you. Peace, peace. It's good to see you, peace people. There we got our Brandy Carl. I love your images. Those are beautiful. And your faces, of course, the very best of all. Thank you so much for being with us this Easter season. We are people of resurrection. We are celebrating all the beautiful ways that God is breaking into this world with healing and joy. So thank you so much for being with us on this day of celebration. If you haven't already done so, let us know you're here by putting your name in the chat. If you are brand new, a special welcome. We so wish we could have you at the donut table and get to know you. Hopefully we will be able to do that soon, but please feel free to drop your name in there if you'd like to leave us your email as well. Um, and also that's a good place to make your offering to the church and also to let us know about any joys and concerns that we might not know about. We have a few big joys this week. Some of you may have seen that there were some really big wins for a justice community like ours, led by Stand Up KC, trying to win a fight for 15 and a fair wage. Biden signed a bill this week that gave 390,000 more Americans $15 an hour and McDonald's has come to the table and they're going to do sexual harassment training at every McDonald's all over the world. So pressure and speaking up and um, putting pressure on shareholders, that makes a real difference. So lots to celebrate. And um, of course, 
lots of people out and about. We miss people when they're not here, but we're so thankful people are able to travel and to be with their people, including um, Jill Eakey and Suzanne Cruz, who will be traveling to Austin this weekend for um, their son John's wedding. So we're delighted for that celebration. Um, also other people who continue to recover. Our prayers are with Cheryl Rose who traveled to South Carolina and is gonna be finalizing a divorce and then the long road back, but a fresh new journey for her. Our prayers are with Peter Strobel's best friend's father, Dennis, who was just diagnosed with a brain tumor. And of course, our thoughts are very close to the people of India and all over the world. And we pray that this difficult moment might be a time when we see that borders God doesn't see them, that every sister and brother is precious to God, and we can do all that we can to try to create a world of more justice and healing, and of course, right here. So we wanna to continue to apply pressure to our own representatives to try to support voting rights for all Americans as those continue to be under threat. So we appreciate, again, your advocacy. This morning, we are gonna hear one of the, my favorite passages, kind of a quirky little passage about the Ethiopian eunuch and um, Peter the missionary, these two who seemingly have nothing in common, who somehow meet and are transformed and go off in a fresh new way. Mark Klein Taylor and many scholars have pointed out that when we meet the one who is different, we have two tendencies. One is to demonize the other, and the other is to romanticize. Oh, the sweet natives, and look how happy the poor people are. And instead, we're called to like a real true coming to meet other people. And that always begins with an honest reflection on ourself, on looking at the things um, deep in Holly that maybe I wanna hide and not show to other people. And, and especially this has been a rich time the last year where we've spent so much more time alone. I think many of us have kind of opened up some of the doors we kind of keep shut and gone, you know, that's, that's not that scary when I look at it. Yeah, okay, I can be really defensive. I can change that, right? So the more we can like see who we are, the more we can see the other. And so what I want your intention to be this week is to really just continue that journey of kind of looking at yourself as honestly as you can and not pushing things that are tough away, just allowing them to be and, and practicing that with other people. And I want us to also think this week about what are those spaces, what we call liminal spaces, those kind of in between out of our comfort zone spaces where we can meet the other and grow. So hold that together this morning as we bring our joys and our concerns, all the things that are on your heart and join our voices in our call to prayer. I hope you find something to love, something to do when you feel like giving up, a song to sing or a tale to tell, something to love, it'll serve you well. Holy One, we thank you for this day and for this group of people. You give us strength and help us to see things from an eternal perspective. Every time we feel limited or small or hopeless, you respond with openness. If we didn't understand what we were to do from the parable of the vine, how we we're to bear fruit with our short, easily distracted and fragile lives, then surely Philip appearing to a lonely Ethiopian eunuch would help us to understand. Or if not with those words, then in the directness of 1 John, we are to love each other, every single other, regardless of culture, color, or wealth. We love others because you love us. We are to reach out and then further out, fearlessly and extravagantly. Lord, you make beautiful things out of us. Help us to live without fear. Help us to recognize the beauty that surrounds, supports, and nurtures us. And please, God, be with India. As they suffer, we all suffer. Amen. Amen. And Brandon, we appreciate that. And Brandon has been to India many times with um, different groups that work to try to bring more um, health justice there. So we appreciate you and we know that your thoughts are with your friends there as well. Um, so this, the book of Acts, of course, is the story of the church being founded. 
And um, some of the stories are successful ones and some not. Today's story is the successful kind of interesting story where these two, again, seemingly opposite, make a connection. And listen in the story for how in the book of Acts, the spirit is always kind of leading and calling us and empowering us to do more. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jer Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So Peter, so Philip went, got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, technically, you know, a castrated male, um, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. And all that detail is a way of showing these two people are very different. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And in those days, even private reading would have been done publicly, so you're reading out loud. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to the chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it, heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and he asked, do you understand what you are reading? And the Ethiopian replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. It's from Isaiah. Like, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, like a lamb silent before its, its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation, for his life is taken away from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with the scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? So he commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water. And Philip baptized him, and when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. I have never seen butterflies like this. They were as big as my hand, and they were as blue as this shirt. I wore this shirt because this is the exact same blue as these butterflies. I was in the botanical gardens, the butterfly garden at in Miami visiting my daughter, and all I could say was, wow, golly, golly. Wow, I just kept repeating that. And Eden, Eden was laughing kind of the way she has done since she's a little girl where she's laughing, but she's smiling and crying at the same time. It's this kind of thing she does when it's just so incredibly amazing and gorgeous. And all I could think of was that, you know, line you're always told that if you want kids to grow up and love the earth and be good caretakers, don't lecture and admonish, right? Take them out into the world and show them how gorgeous and beautiful it is and help them fall in love with it and then they'll want to protect it. But the truth is that admiring beauty is not enough. Just on its own, it can lead to something else. Um, I remember when we talked about um, the National Geographic Apology like three years ago. Do y'all remember that? It was like 2018. National Geographic decided they were going to do their whole April issue on race. Obviously, this is a time of racial reckoning in our country. But then they realized, yeah, we really kind of need to do a self-analysis. So they hired a scholar whose areas were African studies and photography. And the scholar looked at the last 130 years of the National Geographic. And for people who grew up like me, this was a very formative journal, right? It might have been the only journal any of us took. And it was on the coffee table. And this was not the Proud Boys. This was a very formative, informed voice, right? And they looked at that 130 years and they had to say, oh my gosh, you know, the racism in these pages is unbelievable, that we have almost never showed people of color in the United States. And when we do, they've always been as domestics or laborers. And it's just filled with exotic people, exotic places. You know, the West is always portrayed as this kind of modern, you know, technological place. And then the Asia and Africa is kind of backward and stuck in the past. And they ended up doing this really whole entire issue, apologizing and kind of admitting that even Life magazine pushed and kind of challenged American stereotypes. And National Geographic had too often not just documented difference, but kind of created difference and really heightened it. 
Um, and I remember they talked to about the preponderance of beautiful Asian women, that Pacific Islander women specifically, they were just filled with beautiful pictures of them and how exotic and gorgeous. And I thought of that when there was the massacre of the women in Atlanta at the massage part, at the salon. And so many women came forward of Asian descent to talk about how they'd been portrayed, how they were often depicted, you know, beautiful and small, but also submissive and easy to dominate and sexually available and um, very eager to please. And how that had kind of really filtered into this, you know, dominant image where we've got all these salons filled with women whose bodies are just there for the taking, right? So beauty and admiration just on its own, it can lead to exploitation or jealousy, kind of possession. So before you know it, you've got an illegal butterfly trade, right? And you've got people paying $60,000 to get that butterfly and put it in a, you know, paperweight on their desk. Or you've got these places where women are abused and taken advantage of. So it takes more than just admiring and seeing the beauty in the other. It takes creating a relationship. It takes what Mark Klein Taylor calls liminality, being able to get out of your zone and into the liminal space. This may be third place, this place where it's not exactly my comfort zone or your comfort zone, but where we meet each other and we become new. And that's exactly what happens in this scripture. In this scripture, you've got the Philip the missionary. Let's picture the young Mormon kid in the white shirt with the badge and the little black pants and the book satchel walking down the plaza. And then comes a carriage. And in the carriage, there's somebody sitting in a pink shirt, you know, with earrings. And to be honest, you can't really tell if it's a man or a woman, kind of what we call gender nonconforming, who's reading the scripture aloud. And Philip the Mormon says, hey, do you know what you're reading? And the person in the carriage says, no, I need some help. And before you know it, they're in the carriage and they're reading the scripture together. And he's breaking open this life of Jesus, this one who came to do what? To heal us and to include us and to bring every single one, to break down every single barrier. And then to stand with us like this passage, particularly when we're suffering. And then there's this miracle somehow where these two meet where they're touched by the grace of God and they both go into the water and they come out. Their identities don't merge. It's not like, oh, thank God, the happy natives have become like Americans. Oh my goodness, you have taken on our ways, right? No, these two people, they're still their own being. I mean, by legend, this eunuch goes on to be the first missionary in Africa and Philip is snatched away and goes off somewhere else, but they've been changed and transformed because they were willing to, to risk getting into this space together. Um, I remember after Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson and there was so much pain poured out. And one of the suggestions someone made was that the best way to evaluate the police going forward was not to keep track of how many traffic stops they did, but how many people they could name in Ferguson, how many people they knew of course, that takes a lot more time, right, to get to know people than to just write them a ticket. And it takes a lot of risk too, right, to try to sit down on a park bench or join some kids on a basketball court or show up at a church meeting. And you can't blame folks for being afraid of one another. I tell you what, where Joe and I live, like, uh, you can hear the gunshots, you know, a lot of gunshots. And um, if you're the police, you know, and you know a lot of people are packing, I mean, you can understand why people are afraid, right? Afraid of one another. And just a couple of months ago, there was a suicide on the Kansas City, Missouri police force. I don't know if it was really in the papers. It was a tragedy, a suicide always is. It was a young man and he had three children. And a couple of my good friends, colleagues, who are very big activists, they're always involved in Black Lives Matter and they're always there calling for police accountability and trying to change things. But in their role, they also are involved in providing care and um, relief to the police when there's difficult situations. And one of them was talking about how this suicide was processed so differently from one station to the other. Like some of the stations, the captain really made a spot for the officers to talk about what was inside them, right? Oh my God, 
Like, do you think morale is high among anybody? I mean, especially the people who were the little kids who were like, I want to be a police officer, right? You think they feel good about it? You think they like this? I mean, and the depression and the anxiety and the alcoholism and the divorce and the battering, I mean, all of that, right? In some of the stations, it was like, let's share. And then some of them, it was like, yeah, no, everybody's got to buck it up. We're not those people, right? I mean, if we can't come forward with what's inside here, do you think we can meet anybody else in their place, in their vulnerable place? I mean, all of us folks are like our own little butterfly house. When we saw those butterflies, I mean, we had to go through three little vacuum chambers to get in there. It was like we went in, the door shut, you make sure there's no butterflies that escape. We went in, the door shut. We went in, the door shut, until finally we were in this, not their natural habitat, right? And not our natural habitat, but in this protected space where we could observe one another. I keep thinking about that butterfly house, how we have to decide to do the work that we want to love each other and know each other. The people who live in our homes with us, right? And the people who live a few blocks away or on the other side of the world. And we have to decide that we're going to take the time and energy to like get into somebody's butterfly house. And some of us like me, well, you know, if you know me a minute and a half, well, you know me, right? And maybe a minute if I'm talking fast. I mean, it's all out there. But somebody like my husband, well, let me just tell you, one of the good things about COVID is that we've been alone so much together that I don't know, a couple of months ago, I guess he just started telling me about something that had happened to him when he was a little kid. And it was really upsetting. And I mean, if it hadn't been for COVID, it might've been another six or seven years because his butterfly house, he's got a lot more doors, right? To get in there. We have to decide, do we want to get inside? Do we care enough to take the time to not demonize and romanticize, to not stereotype people, but to really know who they are? And the point isn't just so that we can be connected, so that we can have relationships. No, the point is what? The mission of God, of saving this creation, folks, and saving its, cre its creatures. It's, the mission is that we're called to is the beloved community. It's creating a world where every child has got something to eat and every child has got a place to go and kids have got teams that they can be on and they've got adults that love them it's creating a world where our old people have enough to eat right it's creating a world where our kids can grow up and say you know what i don't know what gender i am i just want you to love me i mean we have to decide do we want to do that because that's what this scripture is calling us to, not just to get to know one another, but to get to know one another so we can live out God's mission in us. Muhammad Ali, not the boxer, but a young man in uh, Pakistan, in Karachi, has been doing this his whole life. He was 18 in 1998 when he heard a young a girl, she'd been kidnapped, and taken to be a bride and she was screaming and in the middle of the night he went in a very dangerous situation and rescued her and he has spent his entire life rescuing missing and exploited children in Karachi and they're like three to four thousand children who go missing every year and they're kidnapped they're put into illegal adoptions they're trafficked sometimes they're killed and um, by and large, it's, it's an issue people just look away from. I mean, there are poor kids, many of them. There's disposable, who cares? What he first realized was a lot of times a child is not even a block away. They're very close. And so he realized the first thing you got to do is you got to let parents know when your child's missing, it ain't wait 24 hours, it's that minute. And then he began developing partners. And by the way, now he's saved 4,000 children. He developed partners. He found people that you'd think, oh yeah, good idea, the mosque on the corner. I mean, there's mosques everywhere. Be sure they know. How about the guy who runs the printing press or the gal so that as soon as these kids go missing, we've got their pictures plastered all over. 
And how about the chatty neighbor? You know that person who's got eyes everywhere and knows what's going on? And what about the street vendor? So he began building these alliances with all these people because like every little community has got to be a village, right, that encircles, that's got their own butterfly house to protect these kids. And the minute those kids go missing, you get the word out and you get those kids. And then he looked for like less, you know, common things like, People are crazy about kites there, right? They fly all these kites. He's like, why don't we have pictures of these missing children on the kites so that everywhere we go, we see these beautiful children we're trying to reclaim. But the best ally he found and what's really changed the whole thing is when he decided to ally with members of the transgender community. You talk about people who know the streets, right? You talk about people who know exploitation, who know it in and out. You talk about people who are discarded and overlooked so that they can kind of go wherever they want to go and kind of see whatever they want to see. And they're invisible. They're trash. People don't care about them. People don't see them. So they got their eyes on everything. It started like it always starts with him sitting down with one person and asking, you know, what do you see? Have you seen much? Have you seen this child? And you know how it goes. Then that person got involved with somebody else, and then that person brought somebody else into the mission, and that person brought somebody else. Because these people, guess what? They're beautiful, and they're creative, and they're unique, and they're passionate, and they love their town and their village, and nobody ever asked them ever to help or to be a part. And you know what he's got now? 2,000 volunteers in the transgender community people. That's a lot of eyes out there. That's a lot of people saying, no, you're not taking that kid. No, 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 no. I'm going to hit that kid back right now. And you don't think it's been good for their health? I mean, these people who have been pushed aside, discarded, and now they're meeting people and getting to know people. People know their names. There's health care. You know how it is with that crowd. I mean, the HIV rate, all of the rates, they're just in such tough situations. And they're being brought in and their gifts and their changing these neighborhoods. If we have done anything I am proud of in this last year, it's that last Sunday in January when Leanne and Sean Combe shared after church their journey, their journey from alcoholism to sobriety. We had 60 households stay on for like 45 minutes to listen. And I still, I had two people tell me this week how much of a life changer that was for them. And I think partially it was because Leanne and Sean, who we all respect and love so much, how they shared their journey. Remember the shame and the denial and the humiliation and what would people think? What do people think about me, about my parenting, all of that. And then there was, oh my gosh, the disappointment. I mean, and the fear, it looked like Sean might not live and the anger, feelings of betrayal, all of that, right? And they just laid it all out here. I mean, they just opened their butterfly house, right? And they just shared it. I mean, that's what makes this community an amazing place. I have no idea where we're gonna be worshiping in two months or four months or a year. I don't even know that I care. All I care about is that we're a real place where we invite people to be real and honest about who they are, where we keep looking at one another and saying, image of God, image of God, image of God, image of God, where we keep saying, what the hell, these are my issues, these are my broken places. Is it really any big deal? Do you not think the love and grace of God is so much bigger than the small, stupid stuff inside of me? All I can say, folks, when I think about you all is, wow, and golly. I mean, wow. And golly. Amen. Couldn't be happy in the city at night. Can't see the stars for the neon lights. Sidewalks dirty and the rivers worse. Underground trains all run in reverse. Nobody here can dance like me. Everybody clapping on the one and the three. Am I the last of my kind? Am I the last of my kind? So many people with so much to do. Winter so cold, my hands turn blue. Old men sleeping on the filthy ground. Spend their whole day just walking around. 
Nobody else here seems to care. They walk right past them like they ain't even there. Am I? Last of my kind. Am I? Last of my kind. Daddy said the river would always take me home. But the river can't take me back in time. Daddy's dead and gone. Family farms, a parking lot for the Waltons, five and nine. Am I the last of my kind? Am I the last of my kind? I tried to go to college, but I didn't belong. Everything I said was either funny or wrong. They laughed at my boots, laughed at my jeans, laughed when they gave me amphetamines. Left me alone in a bad part of town. 36 hours to come back down. Am I the last of my kind? Am I the last of my kind? Mama says God won't give you too much to bear. That might be true in Arkansas, but I'm a long, long way from there. That whole world's an old and faded picture in my mind. Am I the last of my kind? Am I the last of my kind? Am I the last of my kind? Am I? Amen. That was so beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That was gorgeous. So this morning, I kid you not, I was running where I have now become, what's now really become my haunt down at 47th and Troost right there where the Anita Gorman Nature Center is. And, um, you know, I'm trying to keep my eyes more wide open and notice the signs of spring and how things are changing. And, you know, there's a few people, some days nobody, some days somebody, it depends on how early. And there was a mom and um, a little boy, I'm gonna say he was three, three or four, maybe four, and they were carrying this, it was like a collapsible net, nest, kind of netting cage, you know, it was maybe about, you know, it looked kind of like a trash, little trash thing like that, but it was netting. And I thought, oh, well, they've got, you know, they, they had something they were obviously gonna release. And so I'm thinking, you know, how it is, kids find crickets and they find, you know, rabbit, you know, whatever they find and they want to save. And so they're going to let this go. So, you know, I kind of waved and then I kept going, kept going. And about 10 minutes later, and the lesson here is always speak to people. You're never going to be disappointed. I just said, oh, are you all releasing something today? And she said, yes, butterflies. She said, we've been, um, we grew these, I don't know how, you know, eggs, and then now they're little cocoons, and now they're, and the little boy's eyes were so big, and were right there, and I was like, you can't be serious. I said, I'm thinking about the butterfly garden, and, you know, just told him, I was, you know, what, I said, I'm a preacher, and blah, blah, blah. She was like, oh my goodness, how neat is that? But anyway, I just said, I'm so thankful for you all. Thanks so much for doing this, right? Like, who knew, right? We can all do our part to bring more butterflies into the world, folks. I mean, I think all of us, as tough as this year has been, right, we found little small things we can do. I mean, helping out in the orchard at Cherith Brook. I mean, you know, I guess I can figure out a way to prune apple trees. I mean, we all can do small things. And I think the best thing we can do is try to look at the people around us and imagine them in a butterfly house and try to think, you know, we all got stuff around us, right? We've all got layers. Some of them, they're thicker. Some of them, maybe we should have thicker ones. But how do we decide we're gonna invest the time in trying to figure out what makes that person tick or 
or what do they need to hear or what kind of love do they need from me and inevitably inevitably we fail we mess up you know we maybe one day out of two I don't know what days I don't know maybe me it's if I've got a good day one out of three we'll call it good but who cares right because guess what guess what as it turns out as it turns out it's not about me as it turns out it's about the grace of God the love of God the unconditional love of God is why we're here folks because there is somehow at the heart of this creation this spirit that keeps calling us that keeps you know calling us saying we're chosen saying we're to rage against the night that we're to be hope for peaceful people and so we gather every single week at this table to remember that it was on the night of the betrayal when Christ Jesus took bread after he given thanks he broke it and said this is my body given for you and in the same manner the cup after supper saying this cup has been poured out for the forgiveness of all sins drink this as often as you do it in remembrance of me let us pray gracious god you've made an earth so very sacred and humanity so very sacred people so deep and wide and full of the complexity of life that it's just impos impossible to unearth it all. How is it even possible that we walk through such a sacred existence with every breath and step and day that we live? Help us keep our eyes up, our ears open, our hearts ready to be extended. Let's show a little more of ourselves. Let us be people who welcome meeting one another, who welcome truth, and who welcome your beauty at every step. As we gather at our tables, we ask your blessing on our bread and cup, and we ask your blessing on each and every one of us. And as we do so, we pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day your daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Come and feast. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing now. Thank you, Lord, for every little thing. Thank you, Lord, for every song I sing. And thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Holly, for another inspiring, uh, wonderful uh, message. Thank you, Paula, for all the technical skills you bring to the table, as well as your beautiful prayers and presence and leadership. Ellie, thank you for everything you bring. Brandon, thank you for the prayer. On that note, let's sing together one more time. Our closing song is One Spirit of Love. The lyrics will be on the, there they are. Uh, we'll follow this up with our sung benediction and then Holly's benediction for the week. One Spirit of Love. Many are the wonders of God, many doors open wide, many roads that are still untraveled, many are the gifts that we share, many burdens we bear, many mysteries still unraveled, many gifts, one spirit of love, one spirit of love, many gifts, one Spirit of love, one spirit of love. Some will be the teachers of life, some the preachers of love, some the fathers and some the mothers. Some will be the ones who will care, some will listen and share, serving God while they serve each other. Many gifts, one spirit of love. One spirit of love, many gifts, one spirit of love, one 
spirit of love. Living is the body of Christ and the heart of the earth and the hands that will break new ground. Celebrate the gifts from within. Now it's time to begin. God's people can turn the world around now. Many gifts, one spirit of love, one spirit of love. Many gifts, one spirit of love, one spirit of love, one spirit of love, one spirit of love. Give me love, give me love, give me peace on earth. Give me light, give me life, keep me free from birth. Give me hope, help me cope with this heavy load. Trying to touch and reach you with heart and soul. that I might understand you. Give me love. Now may the loving God who has created us beautiful and quirky and creative and one of a kind and radiant, who has created us with hearts to love, bring us together so everywhere we go we might be peace and wage peace and love one another every, every single other. other amen amen